Welcome to Censored, a podcast about books that were mad, bad and dangerous to know. Well, according to the Irish censor anyway. I'm Aoife Vrutnach and I read too much for my own good. I'm on Twitter at CensoredPod if you fancy rants about censorship, gender and such things. This week's episode is the first time I'd be reading a non-fiction book. Mari Stopes' Married Love was published in 1918 and it was pretty controversial at the time. When it was banned in Ireland in 1930, it wasn't really a scandalous text anymore. But, as we know from previous episodes, the censor didn't care if a book was old or new. Filth was filth. Stopes was banned for something much worse than smut. She had the barefaced cheek to write about contraception. Under the Censorship of Publications Act, a text could be banned if it advocated the unnatural prevention of conception or the procurement of abortion. Even when books were factual but not indecent, they were banned. Sadly, this means there's not really any saucy bits for me to read out. I'm kind of presuming you all know what bits go where and why. So this week, I'll mix it up a bit and interview a specialist in the history of contraception in Ireland. And I'd like to welcome Deirdre Foley of DCU to the podcast. She's just finished her PhD in the School of History and Geography. Hi, Deirdre. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Tell me, what was your thesis about? Because you're like a baby PhD. You've just submitted. <laughs> and I'm delighted. I'm very tired. Um, it's about women's groups and the Commission on the Status of Women in Ireland from about 1967 to 79. And it mainly looks at the transformation of the laws relating to women during this period, which includes, of course, the long and arduous process of legalising contraception in this country. Long and arduous is right. I mean, it's kind of still going on in some respects, I think. Yeah. Now, I don't know if, like, everyone else needs a drink to get through this book. <laughs> it's it's quite short, in fairness. You know, it's not a long read. It's a bit old-fashioned. It's not specially rude unless you don't like words like coitus interruptus. But nonetheless, I'm having a gin because it's the summer and it seems right to have gin with a bit of elderflower in it. Are you partaking of anything, Deirdre? Uh, I'm on the Diet Coke for now, but I'll have a glass of wine after this. Good plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell me, Stopes. So my copy is like Oxford World's Classics. And it has an intro, which is nearly as long as the actual book by a big mm. name historian. So mm. why is it such a big deal? Like, it seems like a classic text. Well, I'm jealous of your physical copy because I had to go back and reread it online, uh, which wasn't too good for the eyes. But it, it did uh, kind of reaffirm to me that it's it's a very short and frank volume. And Married Love is frank about sex and contraception and it's reader friendly it's a short and clear marital manual um, and you could read it in one or two settings it's important because it explains how to have sex how to enjoy it and how to prevent conception but I think it's also important to note that a lot of Stopes's follow-up publications like Wise Parenthood and um, a letter to working mothers, they were a lot more explicit about contraception than this volume is. But more importantly, I think the reason why Married Love resonated and was such a bestseller was that it, it's written by a female expert at a time when most medics in obstetrics and gynaecology were male. Um, however, Stokes wasn't a gynaecologist. Um, one historian, Alexander Geffert, highlights that the title page of the book Married Love carefully lists out all of Stopes' academic degrees, but it actually withheld from her readers that she didn't hold her doctoral degree in medicine. She was actually a botanist. But in the book, she's not only billed as an expert, but she also imparts her personal experience as a woman in the first person. She tells the story of her first unhappy marriage, which was annulled in 1916, on the grounds that it was never consummated, though her ex-husband did dispute this. It's a story for another day. Um, and she explains in the book that sexual knowledge is essential for partners to avoid such unhappiness 
in marriage. And, and these problems were definitely relatable to a lot of people. And really importantly, the book places emphasis on female as well as male pleasure. Stopes later attributed the success of married love in Britain to the timing. It was the transition from the Victorian marriage uh, with its high number of children and usually the woman's lack of sexual knowledge prior to marriage to the more modern marriage of interwar Britain. So she stated in 1935, quote, this Victorian tradition was then so prevalent that the main ideas in the book crashed into English society like a bombshell. It's explosively contagious main theme that woman like man has the same physiological reaction a reciprocal need for enjoyment and benefit from sex made Victorian husbands gasp end quote so the message was really that sexual fulfillment for both partners was necessary not just for reproduction but actually for what she referred to as mutual joy in marriage so quite progressive in that way yeah I always think when I read it I'm like God, she's actually saying that women should be into sex in a yeah. obvious, joyous, go for it kind of way. And it's clear that she's arguing that the whole book and you're like, God, she has to say this for a whole book. That says a lot about what people actually think women and sex is normally, you know, about. Yeah, I mean, it's it's depressing in that way, but it's also progressive in that way. And you know, the the kind of the message of respect is really there. And I mean, we can talk more about this later, but there's a lot of themes that we can draw out that are really resonant uh, to today, you know, especially with regard to the issue of consent. Yeah, it is it is more a sex manual than a contraception manual. But she does actually, you know, mention explicitly coitus interruptus, barriers. And then what was the third one? Chemicals? I suppose she meant spermicides, did she? Yeah, she did. And I, I think um, even just alluding to these methods was still, you know, new at the time uh, in in some ways. And also this is, I think it's a bestseller that was marketed well to, um, you know, she is very much placed and marketed as a, a, an expert sexologist. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years after the book comes out, out and is selling well. She, she has her own clinic, uh, her birth control clinic in London, um, and there's huge demand. So she's she's definitely kind of gaining a place on the world stage um, after Married Love comes out. I love that she's, you know, like one of the first women sexologists, isn't she? There's not many women before this. I mean, not that I know of. I mean, my expertise is more in the, you know, the Irish field, obviously, which is... um pretty bleak for a long time <laughs> not many um, sexologists here i'd say <laughs> no definitely not that we know of anyways <laughs> although we'll keep looking but her i suppose i think there's something so refreshing about the clarity of her language too even though in certain places she's more alluding to methods of contraception but when she's talking about the physical act and we also have to remember that obviously she parses all of this within marriage. It's in the title. And that was, of course, the norm at the time, um, you know, just at the ending of World War One. But it's something that remains uh, relevant in Irish society for a lot longer than most European countries. <laughs> um, right up to the legalisation of contraception in Ireland, where, where the, the national public conversation about contraception is very much placed within the context of marriage and respectability. Yeah, I, I, I did find it kind of, I suppose, interesting now that it's marketed as married. You know, when you get married, you can get your rocks off. That's OK. <laughs> and absolutely nothing beforehand. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> So, I mean, she was in favour of contraception for some, what I thought were pretty sensible reasons. I mean, she points out that children are expensive. Yes. They're time consuming. <laughs> yes. Uh, they can be bad for the women's health. <laughs> yes. These are all good reasons. And then she also, like, she, she kind of talks about them being exhausting in a general sense, and she's dead mm -hmm. on there. Um, mm -hmm. But she was also, she does briefly sort of get into eugenics 
slightly when she talks about race and all of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, why was contraception part of the belief system of those who were into eugenics? Well, contraception is given, uh, you know, publicity by the, the, those same people who believed in eugenics. So really, especially in the early 20th century, birth control was linked to broader discussions of race and reproduction. And we really can't ignore this fact. It wasn't solely for the elevation of women's status that birth control was promoted, but rather it was believed that birth control presented an opportunity for racial population management whereby white dominance could be achieved and uh, so-called health problems um, eliminated. Now, Stopes was definitely not the first person to make this link um, other white women such as Annie Besant and Margaret Sanger also promoted the idea and um, back in 1877 Besant wrote the law of population which made the claim that quote the whole British race would gain in vigour in health in longevity in beauty if only healthy parents gave birth to children so there's a real sense of who should be reproducing um, and Mary Stopes herself was a member of the London Eugenics Education Society from 1912. And she also met Margaret Sanger around this time and um, remained in communication with her. Um, Sanger was an American advocate of birth control. She wrote Woman and the New Race in 1920. And in that book, she claimed that women who didn't control their fertility were, quote, creating slums, filling asylums with the insane and institutions with other defectives, replenishing the ranks of the prostitutes and inmates for prisons, end quote. So pretty severe stuff. And Stopes goes on to open her own uh, birth control clinic in London in 1921, which provided free birth control uh, to working class women. And she claimed that birth control and the knowledge of birth control would be given there, in her own words, quote, as the keystone in the arch of progress towards racial health and happiness. So, oh God. <laughs> again, very, very severe stuff, especially in the context of the interwar years leading up uh, to World War II. But without wanting to dismiss the severity of Stopes' views here, you know, Still, I guess her her strongest legacy was the provision of contraception and indeed later abortion through her clinics. It's been pointed out that surely many of the working class British women um, whom she provided with contraception from the 1920s onwards, they didn't care whether she thought that they should be discouraged from reproducing for eugenic reasons. They just wanted the choice to limit their family size. And surely having this choice at the time was a relatively new proposition, especially for poorer women. Um, at the London Clinic, advice was given in the 1920s on how to use methods such as a rubber sponge in olive oil, uh, lactic jelly and condoms. And actually also the first birth control clinic in Northern Ireland was a Mary Stokes one and that opened in 1936. Yeah, I mean, she seems like the classic example of a flawed hero. It's like she did the right thing, but for the wrong reasons sometimes. And you feel a bit icky about her reasons, but her long term impact seems to have been much greater than those nasty ideas about racial superiority. Absolutely. Like the, the impact is there, um, but equally it would be erroneous for us to ignore her ideals at the same time. Yeah, it seems to have been an important driver of why contraception even became popular, which is a bit creepy when you think about it. It's definitely creepy. Um, and also, I think it's it's interesting to think about if contraception was, if there had been an attempt to publicise and promote birth control and contraception as purely a women's issue, how much of a platform would it have been given in 1980? Yeah. I mean, fair point. Yeah, you know, tying it to something as controversial as women's lib mightn't have got it so far. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> so it's banned in 1930, like I said. There are actually 10 books on contraception and or abortion banned that year. And there's only three novels. So I think at that point, the censor was 
more concerned about information to do with sex than literary representations of it. At this point, are contraceptives legal in Ireland? What's the legal situation? So essentially, contraceptives are censored before they are banned outright. But the two pieces of legislation are quite close together. So the Censorship of Publications Act 1929 outlawed any literature that advocated or advertised contraception, but it didn't outlaw the sale of contraceptive devices. And subsequently then, Uh, Surprise, surprise, the Catholic Church pressed the government to legislate more clearly on the sale of contraceptives and subsequently the drafting of this legislation that they requested took place at least in partial uh, (laughs) contraception. It took place at least in partial contraception consultation with the Catholic hierarchy. So in 1932, the Minister for Justice, James Gagan, met with the group of bishops and he assured them that he'd like to see a bill um, pass which would bring the law into harmony with Catholic teaching and after this the bishop sent a memorandum to the government listing the prohibition on the sale of uh, contraceptives and their importation as uh, a chief aim. So then after this request was reiterated again, Section 17 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1935 provided that it was an offence to sell or to import or advertise for sale any contraceptive. It's funny that they censor contraception before they ban actual contraceptives. That just seems kind of backwards. It's quite strange. I mean, I think there's there's an awareness maybe that... um, it's been talked about more in the press uh, that the knowledge is growing and I suppose the, the awareness of the problem comes from the news media to a certain extent um, and there's always this idea that the you know the kind of post-colonial idea that the Irish people are, are so pure and innocent and that they must be kept, kept that way rather than their big bad British neighbours um, and you, you have this phenomenon for a long time where, for example, the news of the world is um, forced to have a special Irish edition, which in which, you know, the, the ads for contraceptives or any mention of that sort of information is largely obscured from the, the Irish edition of the paper. So it seems like people were getting more information in the 20s from Britain that they needed to censor it then. Uh, to an extent, I mean, I do think that overall, um, obviously, there was little to no sexual education. Uh, it was such an incredibly taboo subject in, in Irish society. Um, and then the, the, the role of censorship really kind of propagates this and seals the deal. Um, so I think that, you know, a certain amount will always get through to, um, you know, the more educated people. And to, to middle class people and above who have the money and the education to, to get what they need. But as we see in societies across the world, um, the lack of access to, to knowledge and to contraception itself has the most, you know, severe effect on the poor classes of society. It's just the same with the, the banned novels, you know, some people could read them because they had the contacts and the networks to get them. And some people yeah. could get contraception because they knew the right people and they knew the questions to ask. So it's always, you know, it's always the people in regional towns who are relying on public services who never get anything. At the same time, you know, you don't want to underestimate people's intelligence either. Uh, and I don't want to quote my granny on a podcast directly but I remember (laughs) talking to her I remember talking to her about the country girls a couple of years ago um and she said to me she was given out about their stupidity really uh of the characters in the novel and she said you know when we were that age we weren't stupid yeah so there's a certain obviously local transmission of knowledge shall we say that you know you can't censor that either and You know, it depends on your upbringing, uh, all of those things. But certainly Mm -hmm. the cultural norms have, as we know, a huge and devastating effect uh, in terms of people's attitude to sex and I suppose even in their enjoyment of sex in in the longer term. So 
censorship for indecency for novels wasn't as strict from 1968 onwards because they changed the legislation. But that's not true of censorship for information around contraception, is it? Well, information definitely creeps in, but awareness, like I've said, is low for many people. And I think really an example of this huge lack of awareness of just the basic facts of life um, is uh, in the publication of one particular book in 1963 by uh, Michael Solomons. He was a Jewish gynecologist um, and he published a book called Life Cycle Facts for Adults in 1963. And this book was, to his knowledge, the first sexual education volume by an Irish author. But Life Cycle, again, emphasised the necessity of marriage for intercourse to take place. And due to the ongoing censorship regulations, it did not mention contraception at all. Yeah. Uh, although Solom- Solomon's would have been a known advocate of contraception and was involved in the opening of the first illegal family planning clinics in Dublin. And it, it proved popular. Uh, for example, the agony aunt Angela McNamara recommended the book in her column in the Sunday Press. And around this time, what you also see is increase in the discussion of contraception in general, but also ads in women's magazines um, for a particular device. Um, it was a temperature device known as a CD indicator, which was basically an aid for using the rhythm method, which was becoming more popular at the time as well. So it was legal to buy those temperature devices for the use of the rhythm method and to advertise those, but not other forms, even though it's still kind of breaking the rules because you're trying not to have babies. You are. um, There's huge arguments about this, particularly during the 60s. And it's it's quite it's relatively late in Ireland that um, the Catholic Church comes around to the idea of natural family planning. They don't even really propagate that until there's a more immediate tr- uh, threat that um, more contraceptives are coming into the country, uh, especially when the pill comes on the scene in the 1960s. There is a big effort on the part of the Catholic Church to increase education around natural family planning methods, um, particularly the Billings method. And you have that kind of rolled out on a more wholesale basis. But it's it's definitely a case of, you know, the, the horse is already bolted and a lot of people are taking the pill in increased numbers uh, in the 60s. I can't believe that the natural rhythm method is a concession to sort of actual contraception becoming popular. I had no idea. I thought that they had always allowed or sort of promoted the <laughs> promoted the natural family planning method, but it seems like that's a, a reaction to actual con- effective contraception being used. Yeah, absolutely. It's a reaction. And uh, that is, that's definitely unique to Ireland. Um, there had been better education on it in other other countries uh, and far earlier. I mean, it was it was advocated by the Catholic Church for decades. So the Irish are late to the contraceptive sex party once again. Are we surprised? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> so birth control information is circulating sort of clandestinely or under the radar and in all sorts of networks. But yes. when does the sale of contraceptives become legal? So I think what uh, what I'm going to do is actually begin with the illegal phase. Okay. Because I, I think that showing this really also demonstrates the pressure that was on legislators, um, although they didn't react well for quite a long time. So the Irish Family Planning Association provided contraceptives in return for a donation at clinics in Dublin from 1969. And they even started to refer to receive referrals from the Rotunda Maternity Hospital for this purpose, um, which was surely quite radical in itself. Um, but the Rotunda Maternity Hospital, it's really important to note, was the only um, maternity hospital in Dublin City uh, where the Archbishop of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid, did not sit on the board. Uh, so that's how that was able to happen. Uh, other um, 
family planning clinics um, that were distributing contraceptives and information illegally uh, were established in Cork in 1975, Galway in 1977. And you also see postal order services for contraceptive devices in operation from around 1972. And then you also have the Contraception Action Programme or CAP uh, was established in 1976 to campaign specifically for the legalisation of contraception. And the members um, of this group were really motivated by the difficulties faced by working class women who wanted to access contraception and limit the size of their families. So prior to legalisation, CAP was a, a really important network for women in terms of access to and information about contraception. Um, Laura Kelly's done a lot of really interesting work on this. The group flouted the law by uh, selling contraceptives um, at a premises on Harcourt Road and on the Dandel- in the Dandelion mar- Market in Dublin. It also utilised a caravan in Ballymore to sell contraceptives and um, to distribute leaflets and they also collected signatures for a petition to change the law and then if if we go into the beginning of the legal phase with gradual changes the Health Family Planning Act 1979 um, it actually didn't come into force until the 1st of November 1980 and it made contraceptives available by prescription and only for the purpose bona fide of family planning or for adequate medical reasons. So there's a lot of, you know, parsing here. And this largely restricted access to married couples. But the new law also allowed publications with information about contraception uh, to be distributed in Ireland through the Department of Health, um, although the department definitely produced very little in the way of education for some years. And the majority of women's organisations opposed this legislation immediately. And then the law was slightly liberalised in 1985 by allowing condoms to be sold to people over 18 uh, without a prescription. And in 1992, this age was changed again to 17. I mean, 1980, I just can't get over it. So that means yeah. my mother was having children when contraception wasn't technically legal. Yeah, it's it's absolutely wild, isn't it? Yeah. Well, she, I mean, she must have been doing something because she didn't have eight. So <laughs> I have no doubt she was uh, finding her way around it. <laughs> and I mean, what you say then, so it sounds like, Stopes's model almost of married love and everything within the bounds of marriage, all of that architecture around prescriptions and stuff, that's intended to keep contraception within a very limited space. So do you think that it took a very long time for Irish society to move beyond the the married love vision? Definitely a very long time, I would say, you know, right up to the 90s, really. Um, I mean, don't forget, it's not unrelated that uh, it wasn't until the early 90s that marital rape became a crime, for example. But uh, yeah, I think the the marriage model is a way also to talk about sex in a respectable way. It doesn't mean that everybody adhered to it. So, you know, people obviously don't want to talk about extramarital sex. We know, of course, that that doesn't mean that it was happening. It's just completely hidden. Also, let's not forget that the whole conversation around contraception at this time was entirely heteronormative, which created huge problems in the 1980s and 1990s when it came to having the conversation about AIDS um, and who had access to condoms, etc. It had long lasting effects in that way, too. It's extraordinary how pervasive something like these discussions on contraception is and how it just orders so much about the surveillance of people's sex lives by the state. It's just fascinating. It's so uh, all encompassing. Absolutely. And it's it's the reticence to, to talk about the realities. So do you think that Stope still reads well? Because, you know, the sexual landscape has changed so much. Yeah, I actually, I do think so, yes, uh, in some parts, aside from the eugenics issue, obviously, um, particularly in Ireland. 
there are parts of married love that still form part of our modern conversations. For example, she's big on consent. So here's one quote. She states, quote, it should be realized that a man does not woo and win a woman once for all when he marries her. He must woo her before every separate act of coitus, end quote. She also takes care to really frame consent within her argument for sex education. And she states that to allow a girl to marry without the necessary sexual knowledge will only result in trauma. Um, she says, quote, when girls are brought up without sexual knowledge, when they're married, it is rape for the husband to insist on his marital rights at once. It will be difficult or impossible for such a bride ever after to experience the joys of sex union for such a beginning must imprint on her consciousness the view that the man's animal nature dominates him. So, you know, she's saying that this could be a really traumatic experience if the necessary education isn't imparted. And she also argues against the notion of virginity and purity. Um, another thing that is still quite relevant today, especially much more in relation to women, of course, than men. And I think that this following passage definitely still stands up. Quote, the idea that woman is lowered or soiled by sexual intercourse is still deeply rooted in some strata of our society. Many sources have contributed to this mistaken idea, not the least powerful being the ideals of the church and the fact that man has used woman as his instrument so often regardless of her wishes. Women's education and the trend of social feeling have largely been in the direction of encouraging the idea that sex life is a low physical and degrading necessity which a pure woman is above enjoying, end quote. So there's plenty there that is still part of conversations that we're having today. So if you could summar summarize it, it could say, don't rape your wife and don't slut shame women who have sex. I have some basic, pretty good tenets or, or rules for life there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was obviously very radical in 1918. I mean, some people would argue it's still radical, you know, given how some people think. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I just want to do the censorship bingo and see how... Like, I know it's not smutty, right? Because it's too factual to be smutty. You, you know, you, you can't really call it rude in that sense. Okay. So, on my first line, I have feminism. Can it be argued like that it's kind of like a proto-feminist text or is that pushing it too far? I'm always very hesitant to call, you know, female historical figures who didn't themselves identify as feminists. I don't want to call them feminists. Yeah, fair but point. I think we can de definitely call it a female friendly or a pro woman text. Yeah. Um, there's no orgies in it. Obviously, it doesn't really mention anything except married love between man and a woman. That's it. There's no drugs. No. Masturbation. It does mention masturbation, doesn't it? I can't remember that. I think it says it things like, oh, it, it sort of, it mentions it obliquely in terms of birth control sort of aspects and Catholic arguments about sperm dying, oh. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of oblique. It doesn't actually say, you know, go have a wank or anything as part of your sex life. Um <laughs> Racism. Well, yeah, I suppose it does really have racist elements because the eugenics isn't great. No, it's not great. And I, I don't think this is her most eugenic text out of everything that she published. Um, but I mean, we cannot obviously disassociate her with the eugenic issue. Yeah, it's yeah. You have to see her warts and all, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no sex toys. Menstruation. I think it just it mentions that it exists, but it doesn't go into detail. No, she mentions uh, like that in a lot of Jewish traditions that women are discouraged from sex for a week or 10 days after their period, things like that. But she doesn't really formulate a huge opinion on it, I don't think. Yeah, and it doesn't give a lot of information on that side of the female mm -hmm. reproductive system either, which is kind mm -hmm. of a pity. But I suppose it would have been very long had she got into that. <laughs> 
and sex work. It, she does mention prostitutes a few times, doesn't she? Mm. Yeah, she does. So we could tick that box. Yeah. Extramarital pregnancy. Well, no, because it is actually, as you keep saying, married love. So leave that yeah. aside. <laughs> crime it doesn't really no i don't think you could tick that box well no i, I mean she talks about rape well, that's true yeah, yeah. so you, yeah you could argue that she yeah she does mention sexual assault oh yeah as a crime yeah. yeah um there's no direct mention of politics although all of these things are always political yeah she doesn't mention breasts yay a book that doesn't actually talk about <laughs> boobs <laughs> Mustn't have been written by a man. <laughs> I swear, nearly every book, even if it doesn't talk about anything else, talks about boobs. <laughs> Sexual assault. Yeah, I mean, I suppose those references to rape and that could could classify as, you know, pretty explicit references because it is about consent. Yeah, it makes it very clear that a man, you know, having sex with a woman before she's ready or sufficiently aroused is a crime and is wrong contraception yes although as you say if you want to know more about contraception you would have read her other books yes yes uh abortion there's no mention at all well there's mention that the catholic church thinks it's a bad idea but nothing else infidelity no i don't think it did really talk about infidelity even when she talks about marriages breaking down over sexual incompatibility. She doesn't talk about infidelity as part of that. I think there's one, I can't remember exactly, but I felt like she alluded to it hmm. just in terms of the natural phenomenon of the sexual relationship breaking down and particularly what the man um, is most prone to do in that situation. But she doesn't go into it very specifically either. Yeah. Oral sex, no. It is pretty much penis meets vagina kind of sex guide, isn't it? Yeah, because I mean, even though she's 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 emphasizing that you know sexual intercourse isn't just about reproduction, she's still pretty vanilla. Yeah, uh, in her view of sex. Yeah, I mean, she does talk a lot about you know that people have to be stimulated, but actual no, you know, guide to how you might get there, <laughs> sort of. Yeah. But I, I actually think that those kind of illusions, um, you know, just sort of hints um, actually made the text very appealing to a lot of people. And I think that might be kind of behind the selling as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That, the, you know, you can let your imagination run wild and work out how <laughs> one might get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't have any graphic violence. No bestiality, unsurprisingly. Um, no. Genitalia, of course, yeah, because it's a sex manual. I mean, she actually talks about the clitoris, you know. Mm -hmm. um, fair play. Fair play, I know. Blasphemy, that's a difficult one because so much of what the Catholic Church disagrees with is kind of automatically blasphemy. Um, yeah. But I suppose not really. Yeah, although she, you know, she criticizes, as we've discussed, you know, the the, the fact that the church has propagated this idea of virginity and purity in women. So I suppose to some people it's blasphemy to even say that. Probably the Irish bishops would consider that blasphemy because they had a very low tolerance threshold of anything. Very. So LGBT plus, no, like we say, it's all heteronormative. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Divorce don't think so well she says you know she she tells the story of um her first marriage being annulled although it she's at pains to point out that it was annulled on the grounds that it wasn't consummated so it wasn't divorce per se well i suppose they they do allow annulments however rarely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, there's no swearing. There's no filthy language whatsoever. So it's, uh, it's <laughs> oftentimes very poetic rather than filthy. Yeah. So it is a score of what is it? Seven or eight? I think it's about. I think it's eight. Actually, if we include the sexual assault and the crime. Okay. 
Um, so that's not bad, actually. I'm surprised because a lot of the banned books are about the five mark. Oh, yeah, it's, it's actually not too bad, is it? It's not bad, really. I mean, given that it doesn't, you don't feel it's rude at all when you read it. No, but at the same time, you can imagine the, the radical nature of it at the time and even I think a lot of people listening to this will remember um, the episode of Downton Abbey uh, that includes the book. Do you remember that? No, or, I don't. Tell me. One of the main characters is caught with it or something like that. I actually can't remember the specifics, but I know that the book featured in an episode and that that would have been around the year. It, it would have been set in around 1918, 1919. So very interesting. And I think that the show kind of placed the book also in the context of the wealthier, educated, unmarried woman being able to access this text, um, which is an important context. So it's like Mary Stopes is like a touchstone then for contraceptive information. I mean, her name alone, the Stopes clinics and everything. Yeah, yeah. Huge connotations there. And was this band then from 1930 until they changed the legislation to allow the circulation of contraceptive information? Like, was it banned up until the 80s? Yeah, like, I don't think it lapsed, you know, with the 1967 legislation, although I haven't checked this. But like we mentioned earlier, obviously information um, and was circulated about contraception after it was finally legalised in 1980. So we can definitely say that the book was not banned in 1980. So, that, I mean, that was great. <laughs> Thanks so much, Deirdre. That was excellent. I have learned so much and I, my eyes have been opened to the real horror of contraception legislation in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> it's grim and that's that's what we like to read about thanks so much Aoife <laughs> that's great next episode will be a resumption of the normal smutty service this podcast provides going back to novels I will be reading the salacious parts of Patricia Highsmith's novel Carol published in 1952 it wasn't banned until 1959 Maybe it took the censors a few years to notice that it was a novel about lesbians. Until next time, practice safe sex and indulge your impure thoughts while giving two fingers to the long-dead Irish censors. Mm-hmm.